message itself, some of you here will find a word of encouragement to keep you on the path that God's called you on. All right. In, in Luke chapter 1, of course, that's the story when the angel appeared to Mary. Also the story where uh, Elizabeth was appeared to by the angel, and she brought forth a son, and of course that was John the Baptist. And I won't pick it up in verse 67. You can read the whole chapter. But I want to read this to you. Verse 67. And his father, John the Baptist, father Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant us that we, being delivered out of the hand of the enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, speaking of John, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, which is Jesus. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of God, of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the way of peace. And the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Lord, let us glean from this what you would have us to glean tonight in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to pick up on a few things before I get to the message. Notice, when Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost, he began to prophesy. And that's what Joel prophesied would come. So this was the forerunner. He said, you'd be filled with the Holy Ghost. Your sons and daughters would prophesy. And so here he is prophesying the word of the Lord. And he's, re he's quoting back the scriptures that talked about the day would come when uh, the forerunner of Jesus would come. And that through Jesus, then there's going to be some things to happen. One, he said, we'd be saved from our enemies. Thank God we're saved from our enemy. We need to understand that we are saved from our enemy. A lot of times that's us. But most of the time, you know, the enemy sets traps up. So we're saved from that enemy. All right. And then he said he, it's going to, he's going to perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. He's made a covenant with us. All right. And then he's talking about he would deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we might serve the Lord. How? In holiness and in righteousness all the days of our lives. So there's some things I want us to glean from. And then he said you would go before the, high, the, the highest, which was Jesus, and he would give knowledge of salvation through by forgiving us of our sins. So if you've been forgiven of your sins... There's a knowledge of God that you have that other people don't have. That's right. You come to know Him through a genuine repentance. Right. That's right. Don't get an amen. Come on. You man. must repent. I mean, there's there's no way of getting around repentance. You will never be changed until you totally and completely repent. Amen. It's, it's not there. People can make all kinds of confessions with their mouth, but until the heart is totally changed through repentance. And I'm not saying just saying I'm sorry I got caught. Come on. I'm Come talking on. about a godly sorrow that worketh repentance Come unto on. salvation. Amen. I'm talking about, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate. I'm a sinner. Lord, I need you. you. Yeah. And I want you to forgive me. I need you to come into my life and be Lord of my life. Forgive me. And you know what he does? He does. He wipes away the past as if it never happened. Yeah. So if you're clean from that moment on and you walk with the Lord. <clears throat> so he gives you knowledge. By the remission of your sins. And then he comes to visit with us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Yeah. But verse 80 is where I want to go to. Right. 
And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Right. You say, how in the world did you get a message out of that? One, John the Baptist was called and designated and selected by God yes. to perform a specific task or a mission yes. or a uh, something that he had chosen for him to do. Yes. This was John the Baptist. He was called. And then, notice what he said. He was in the desert until he's shown in Israel. Somewhere from the time he was born and he was turned loose from his parents, he wound up in the desert, in the wilderness, eating locusts and wild honey. This was a man sent on a mission by God, and he's in the desert. Until the day he says, okay, John, it's time to arrive on the scene and do what I've sent you to do. And then he come and he performed the doing of the mission. They found him in the Jordan River baptizing and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message that I want to try to get through tonight, you're called for a divine purpose. Specifically designed by God, Ooh, yes. you're called. But in that calling, there's a time of preparation. There's your desert experience. The Apostle Paul, after he was converted on the road to Damascus, he wound up in the desert. He wound up for a while by himself getting revelation. He wound up by himself being taught of God many revelations that the other apostles didn't even get who had walked with Jesus for over three years. So there's a time of preparation. And then there's the fulfillment of the calling if you stay on course. If you stay on course. I don't know where you are tonight. Maybe you've just been called. Maybe you've just found out what your designated purpose is. I don't know. You may be in your wilderness experience. And you might say, Lord, what in the world's going on with me? I feel dry. I feel barren. I feel empty. I feel like I don't have any purpose. What, what's going on here? Just hang on. You're about to get a burning bush experience. Right. You're about to encounter God because as you... Stay in your wilderness experience and allow God to teach you in His time. Thank you, Sister Beverly. In His time, He's going to do a great work in our lives if we're on course. And then you're going to step into that designated calling, and then you're going to do. You may be in your designated calling for a short period. You may be in it for 40 years. You may be in it longer. I don't know what the time frame is, but I believe God's trying to show us. That no matter where we are in our walk with God, stay on course. All right. That's right. Because All right. it's about to be That's fulfilled it. in some of his life. Some of you are about to go into the wilderness. Because you have just figured out what God wants sent me here for. But whatever the purpose is, there's three things. You're called, you're selected. There's a song that um, Laverne Tripp says, We are the ones that are blessed. We've been called and chosen and uh, picked out from the rest. So, everybody is called, the Bible says. Many are called. Many have been given an assignment from heaven. But only few will answer the call. Right. And then out of the few, I don't know how many will stay on course. Because you say, well, God's not living in my life. God's not talking to me. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not, I'm not seeing miracles. I'm not seeing things happen. And so you get off course. That's right. mm -hmm. Through discouragement through trying, struggling with trying to find out where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing, on, stay man. in the wilderness Great. until God sends you one, a word from heaven, or sends you to the burning bush. Right. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, God will let you know when it's time to arrive on the scene and to do what you're supposed to do. So don't get discouraged in your wilderness experience because when Jesus was baptized, he went up there for 40 days. <laughs> and he was tempted. Afterwards, he was hungry. He was fasting. He was, you know, with, with talking to the Father. He, he was being in his wilderness, in his training. You say, well, why would Jesus, the Son of God, have to be trained? Why would he have to have a wilderness experience? I don't know. <clears throat> but he was flesh. That's why he had to have most of it. Because he had to be taught of God. 
and shown God. Because he was a man just like you are, in, in flesh just like we are. So he was getting prepared for his designated purpose, and that was to go to the cross. Had he not had his wilderness experience, he would have never fulfilled what he was sent here to do. John the Baptist would have not, Moses would have not been the man he was without his 40 years on the backside of the desert feeding right. sheep. So when we look at our lives, if you look back on your life, and as I look back on mine as I studied this message, I thought, Lord, there has been many times I felt like I was in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing was happening. I wasn't really being, you know, doing good things for God. Opportunity wasn't there sometimes. And sometimes it was me, and sometimes it was circumstances. Whatever it was, I felt like, you know, I was walking through a dry place. But in that, I look back, and I see from that, I've had many encounters with God. And I'm sure you have too, as you walk out your divine purpose. So we've been called, but there's a time of preparation. A time of preparation. And you don't always understand it either. You don't understand the things that you go through. You don't understand the circumstances that you're brought through. A lot of times you think, well, I just made a bad choice. Mm. Or I, maybe I just, you know, I, I'm just this or that. But oftentimes in those situations, God's taking advantage <laughs> of what the enemy is trying to do and he's using it to train us to be patient, to be understanding, to be loving, to be caring. You know, I, I had to. Um, I, I had a lot of. I had a lot of changing in me, over many different circumstances and situations, and um, God used it in that wilderness experience to bring me and Bill right above I was pastor boat to this place where we are. But I, I want to take a little not a side trip, but I want to expand on this. He said, "What am I called for?" First of all. In 1 Timothy 2 and 4, this is, this is one of your, your first and foremost calling. In 1 Timothy 2 and 4, it says this. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Now, first of all, you're called for salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The first thing you're called for is a divine encounter with God through salvation. I mean, you need an experience of salvation. You need to know God. You need to, you know, uh, I, I know I'm from the old school, but I believe people ought to pray. I believe people ought to touch God. I, I, I have led people to pray because they didn't know how. But I believe that a person needs to pray. They need to ask God. They need to change. If you haven't been changed after your encounter with God, you didn't get saved. Excuse me. I'm just telling it like it is. You did not get saved if you didn't change. Because he said he would give us knowledge of God through our remission of sins. So if you don't get your sins remitted, you can't know him. And so when we humble ourselves and ask God to forgive us, we're a sinner, we acknowledge our need of God, and the Lord comes into our life, I'm not saying that you're going to hear bells and whistles, you know, and, and earth is not going to shake with thunder and lightning, but there's going to be a change in your spirit. Something's going to happen inside of you. There's a knowing inside of you that's going to know, because John said, uh, you can know. You, you have eternal life. There's a knower in there that knows that you have eternal life. Something has changed. And then when you get up from where your, where your altar is or whatever, then you're going to be able to look at people and say, you know what, I've just had an encounter. I know now that I know the Lord. And when, when you look, but that's not where you stop. You're not, you're not just saved, you know, and get a, get a fire insurance policy. I just want to give in and then you go and do whatever you want to. That's not... That's not going to work with God. Amen. Salvation is an eternal experience. Come on. It's supposed to last. It's not supposed to be straying off from it either. You're supposed to stay right on course. Because you've been called to do something else. Great. You're called to reflect His glory. You're called to reflect His glory. Let's turn to John um, chapter 1. And let, let's look at what His glory really is. 
in John chapter 1. And we are called to do this, and I can prove it to you by the Word of God. We're called to reflect the glory uh, because there's going to be not only a glory revealed in us eternally, but there should be a glory revealed in us right now. What is the glory of God? It's the presence of God. Right. All right. It's the presence of God. And so in John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Notice what it is. And the life in Jesus was the light of men. Light. What is light? Light is an illumination of something. It reflects something. So, all right, and he said, then he goes on to tell, uh, talking about John. He was, John was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which does what? Light of every man that cometh into the world. So that tells me every baby that's born is a reflection of God's glory. If they continue on course, they become a illuminating force in this world to be the light of the world. Because Jesus has put in them the babies, the created beings that the Lord has sent into this earth. From the time they're born, they get a light. And you know, children, it's so easy to teach children. They just receive it because they have the ability and the capacity. It's only when you get old and don't want to comprehend it, right? All right, okay, let, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. And this is what Jesus told us to do to reflect that glory. Matthew chapter 5 and 14, verse 14. You are the light of the world. He was the light of the world. And now His glory is going to be revealed in us and we become the light. That's right. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all them that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, not before God, but before men, that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, uh, the message that I talk about being witnesses unto him, you become a witness <laughs> unto the Lord by the light that you reflect. When, when we have illuminating experience with God and we become the light of the world, then we're a witness unto Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you reflect me, so that's a witness of what his life and what he's doing. So we're witnesses unto the Lord. We witness to people by witnessing and being a witness for Him because we're the light of the world. Okay. So we're light. So they glorify um, our Father which is in heaven. So we're the light. So we've been called to salvation. We've been called to reflect the glory of God. Amen. But in Colossians 1 and 13, if you'll turn there. Philippians, Colossians, it's right there somewhere. I'm using Pastor's Bible, things are flying out everywhere. <laughs> Colossians 1, we, we've used this scripture so many times. It says in verse 13, Who hath delivered, as past tense, us from the power of darkness. And what did he tell, what did uh, Zechariah prophesy? Zechariah's prophesy? That he would lead people to the knowledge of the Lord and that we've been delivered from the hand of the enemy. So he's delivered us from the power of darkness. You may be walking through the darkness, but you're delivered from the power of it. All right. All right. See, and when you're delivered from the power of it and has translated, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And the word translated... Uh, when you study this word out, it's talking about being moved, being changed, but it also has a connection with the Greek word covenant. So we're in a covenant kingdom. We've been translated to a covenant kingdom. And we're in covenant with the one who created the kingdom. We're so closely in connection with the covenant kingdom 
that the Father, God, becomes our Father and we become His sons and daughters. That's how close in covenant we are with Him. Now, when the king and the queen's children are, you know, they're born and then the kingdom, they become the, the prince and the princesses, right? They also become next in line to the throne. That's right. So, what does it tell us we're going to do? We're going to rule and reign with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Yeah. That's how much in covenant we are with him. We've been called to be a part of this covenant kingdom. Covenant kingdom. All right. And, and the word translated also, I had it written down to where I could, you know, say it just like it's, it's meant to say, but um, the person who has invited you to be a part of this kingdom denotes your place in this kingdom. In other words, if I can say it in plain English is, when you're in this kingdom, your place is established in this covenant kingdom. Now, you're established in this covenant kingdom as a son of God. Son of God. And the reason why he said, Beloved, now are you the sons of God. Even though you may be a female down here, you're still a son of God. You know why? Because you are in the authority of the kingdom. Has nothing to do with your gender. It has to do with your spiritual relationship with God, which is a son, one who's in authority. Come on, man. <laughs> so you've been called into the kingdom authority. Right. What did he tell Adam? He said, I'm giving you a place in this earth where you have dominion over everything. He said, I've delivered you from the power of darkness, so you've got dominion over darkness. I've delivered you from your enemy, so you have power over your enemy. In Psalms, he said, I know now that God has favor upon my life because he did not let his enemy, let my enemies triumph over me. If you overcome anything in this life, you're stronger than that. That's right. That's right. And God has made us stronger than our enemies. That's right. What is our enemy? It could be something in your mind. It could be something in your body. It could be something outside of you. It could be whatever is attacking you and trying to influence you or pull you down. But you have authority over that. Amen. You are in authority in the kingdom that has given you the authority. And Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall my enemies say. No weapon formed against me will prosper. And, you know, any word that's going to rise up against me in judgment, I can condemn it because I am in a kingdom, a covenant kingdom of authority. Why don't we live there? Because we don't really comprehend what it's all about. But we're the king's kids. We're sons and daughters of the most. So the one who called you, he's the one that made the decision about your position in the kingdom. Not you and not me. But he did. He established your relationship with him. He called you out of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of work of his dear son. So that's where we are. We're not going to, we're not going to, the Bible says that we reign in life by one, Christ Jesus. So we're in kingdom covenant. He's called you to salvation. He's called you to let your light shine to reflect His glory. He's called you into the kingdom covenant relationship so you'll be able to know where your position is. And He's called you to be an overcomer. That's right. He's called you to be an overcomer. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, it's like this. He said these words. Oh, uh, Okay. 517, that's, just, that's not right. Ephesians 5. No, Romans 517, excuse me. I'll get the wrong, wrong thing. Romans 517. It says, For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more are they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. How many has received abundance of grace? Amen. 
How many has received the spirit of righteousness? All right. And received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall what? Reign in life by one Christ Jesus. So it's telling me that down here, I'm an overcomer. I'm reigning in my covenant relationship with him. That's my position that he's placed me in that I can be an overcomer or I can reign in life by one. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 3. I mean, excuse me, Revelation. I'm, I'm having a hard time reading my notes. I scribble them so fast. Revelation chapter chapters 2 and 3. And then let's look at what he said about who's going to be rewarded to be this overcomer. So we're called. We spend a time in preparation, maybe in our desert. And then we reach the fulfillment, not only in our calling down here, but there's a higher reward than just down here. All right. Okay. I'm going to go through this quickly in Revelations chapter 2. All right. He goes to the first church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. All right. Let's, let's read what he said to the one that overcome. Look at verse... Uh, Verse 10 says, Fear none of these things which I shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison. You may be tried. You'll have tribulation ten days. Be thou what? Faithful unto death. And what do you do? I will give you a crown of life. So we are called to receive crowns. Life. Eternal life. But you've got to stay the course. You need to know you're called. You need to go through whatever preparation that's required of you and me. And then we need, one day we're going to receive that crown of life. That's not going to fade away. And then he goes on to um, tell us in, in, the, in the church of Hermas. Uh, he goes on to tell, and I, I didn't have these marks, so I'm having to go through quickly to find them. Um, look at 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcometh, Will I give to eat of a hidden manna? Can you imagine? Now, I haven't got time to go into all what this means. Hidden manna. And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You're getting a name nobody else has got. All right. It's going to be special, designated, and designed by the one who called you to be an overcomer. Can you imagine when you walk up there? And he, he gives you a name that, that, that you know what, that name's going to have a meaning. And that name is going to uh, reflect on who you are in relationship to the kingdom. Based on the fact that you know your call, you went through your preparation, and now you're going to stand there and receive the fulfillment of the promise of an overcomer. All right, let's go on. All right, uh, notice what he said. Uh, in, in verse 11, I didn't say that, but he that overcometh will not be heard of the second death. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right. Uh, then let's go on to the third one. I think it's uh, Tyra. Um, yeah. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the church. Who's the morning star? It's just like Jesus is saying, I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to give you the morning star. But you, I'm going to give you power over the nations. Can you imagine? What, what an honor. You're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So you're going to have power over all the nations because the one you're in covenant with has that power. But, he, but I'm trying to get you to understand he's called you into this covenant relationship so that you and I can be what he wants us to be, okay? So we're in covenant with him. All right, so he said, I'm going to, uh, and you'll have so much power that you'll be able to squash all the powers that would dare come against the Lord himself. All right, then he goes on to the Sardis. Uh, Y'all find that one? He that overcometh, verse 5. He that overcometh, 
the same, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You're going to have a name in the book of life. He's not going to be blotted out if you're an overcomer. But I will confess his name before my Father and before the holy angels. Amen. Can you imagine? How would you feel when you get to all hell and stands back with attention and you hear this name called out, Billy Trover or Ron Cherry or Karen Holiday or Linda Allen or, you know, when God calls your name out, can you imagine? Heaven's going to recognize you. You've been called to obtain this. I've been called to obtain this. And, it's, and I'm trying to get to you. It's worth every effort you put forward to get it. No matter what you have to do. Before the, Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worthy to, to even to compare with the glory that will be revealed in us. And we have to overcome this flesh and everything daily in order to be in that position to be an overcomer. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Let's see. That was five. Uh, Philadelphia. Oh, thank you. He that overcometh will I make a pillow in the temple of my God. And that's not talking about a feather pillow either. That's not a pillow. It's a pillar. Pillar. <laughs> you know what that is? That's a support system. I mean, you're going to be one of those strong warriors that, that's going to help hold up the kingdom. God's going to make you so strong and so solid. And so much strength that you're going to be like a, a, this pillow over here or this, this thing that's holding up this building. I mean, God's going to recognize you for your a covenant relationship because you're, you're in covenant. I mean, he said, you're in so, it's just like you've locked arms with him. And that's what Jesus says, come unto me all that are labor and heavy laden and I will give you and take my yoke. In other words, yoke up with me. Become arm in arm with me. Come heart to heart. Mind to mind, strength to strength, uh, ability to ability. Let me let me flow into you what you don't have, and you give me what you need to give me so that it can be a covenant relationship. So he said, I'm going to make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. In other words, that thing don't walk, the pillars of this building don't walk away. They stay solid, and that's what he's talking about. You're going to be so uh, stationary. <laughs> That you'll never have to leave that position ever again. Thank you, Lord. He said, I'm going to make you a pillow. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him <coughs> my new name. Remember he's talking about in Revelation where he had a name that, you know, uh, that, that nobody knew his name. I mean, you, we won't know till we see him in all of his glory, and he said, I'm going to give him that name that God's going to give me. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right. And the last one is Laodicea. And he said, uh, to him that overcometh, verse 21, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as also overcame, and have sat down with my Father in his throne. You have an ear? You need to hear what the Spirit's trying to say tonight. We're an overcomer. We have been called to be an inheritor. We've been called. 1 Peter 1 and 4. Let's turn that real quick. 1 Peter 1 and 4. First Peter 1 and 4 says, We've been called to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Where is it? Reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven. You're called to get this inheritance. I just want to give you some thoughts to think on tonight. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to his purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we're in covenant relationship, designated by him, what the relationship is, and we've obtained an inheritance because the Bible says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, and so we have this inheritance. 
being predestinated according to his purpose of him who worketh all things, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also you also trusted after you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have a promise of an inheritance, which is the earnest of our inheritance. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and we have a deposit from heaven already that says, you're mine, I'm going to buy you completely when your redemption is complete, when the body is translated from this earthly tabernacle to the glorious body, the glorified body. He said, you've got an, you've got an earnest part in you that I've deposited in you, and you're mine. You're mine. I bought you. I bought you with a price. You know, when you go buy a house, you understand the language. You put down an earnest deposit on that property or car, whatever you're buying. And you say, you know, that's mine. I'll bring you the rest of the money, or when the closing comes up, we'll pay for the whole thing. So that's what he said. When you leave this life, when your body either go by the way of the grave or by the way of the rapture, this body belongs to me. This spirit belongs to me. The soul belongs to me. I bought you, and you stay faithful to your calling, and you're mine. So you're going to go up with him. All right. He said it's, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purpose, purpose, purchase, possession. Now that's like when you buy the house, it got the earnest money until you redeem the house and pay the full price unto the praise of his glory. And wow. verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, revelation, that's what it's saying. You need a revelation of what God has really done for us. All right. We need a full revelation. It's just not, well, I'm saved and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking down this life and I'm a Christian. Folks, it's time to know what you are in Christ. Amen. It's time to understand that heaven is there for you. Right. That you are designated by God to, to be in this position to have an inheritance. You're born into a kingdom that you will receive an inheritance from. That's if you was born into a rich family and you did the right thing and they didn't disinherit you or something, you, you were entitled to what they had. Same way with Jesus. If you're born into his kingdom, he's translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. So whatever he has, he has is ours. We're joint heirs with Christ. Yes. So well, I've never heard anything like this. It's time to realize who you are. Right. You've That's let right. the enemy shake you up long enough. You've let him steal from you, destroy everything around you. It's time to rise up, you know, and back up your shoulders and say, I know who I am in Christ. Get away from me, devil. I'm tired of this. I'm going to understand my position. I am in covenant relationship with all of these promises that's in the Word of God. All right. All right, notice what he said. That the eyes of your understanding, that you would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints of God. What is it? Amen. Not only that, but we're going to turn to Revelation and then I'm closing. I guess, after a while, sometime. So I'll go to this message. All right, Revelations 19. You know, you've got to keep eternal values in view. You can't let the enemy discourage you. You can't let him turn you aside. You can't let him cause you to say, well, what's the use? You may be in your wilderness experience, but just hang on. Look around you. The bush may already be burning, and you haven't found it yet. All right, Revelations 19, verse 9 says, Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true sayings of God. Right. Blessed are you. Did you know you're called to be in that marriage supper? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You're called to be the bride of Christ. Right. And you're called to be married to him eternally in a sense of a one flesh relationship. Okay. Can you imagine how close that is? He said, you've been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Don't lose sight of this, folks. But that's not all it is. In Revelation chapter 21, he said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, from, for the first heaven 
and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Notice we just read about, you know, we'd have a part in that New Jerusalem, right? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So not only are we called to salvation, called to reflect the glory, called in the kingdom to do something for God. And God determines that. You know, you don't, you don't get prophesied over you're going to be this and you're going to be that and you're going to be something else. You don't have to do that. God puts you in the kingdom where he wants you. God puts you in the kingdom. He places you as a lively stone and builds you up a spiritual house. He knows how to take care of you. He knows how to do the calling. He knows how to do the training. He knows how to do the qualifying. He knows what to do with you. And, and he puts those desires within you, and he brings it to pass. He's called you to reflect his glory. Because the more you're like him, the more you reflect his glory. He's called you into a covenant relation in his kingdom. So he will determine that relationship, and he already has, by making us a son of God. He's called us to be an overcomer. He's called us to, to obtain an inheritance. He's called us finally to arrive at our fulfillment of all that we've done in this life and be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then beyond that, eternity with God. He's going to wipe away all the tears. We don't have to sorrow no more. There's no more trouble, no more anguish, no more pain. He said, I'm going to be right with you. Can you imagine the God of heaven who created all this universe that we can't even imagine his wisdom and his ability and mind and power is going to walk down and talk with you. Just like he did Adam. In the cool of the day, he came down and he spoke with Adam directly out of heaven. He spoke to Moses face to face as nobody else had ever seen and witnessed. Folks, you have a relationship with the Lord tonight. You've been called to greater than what you can imagine or I can imagine that we could be. The Lord's waking us up to a greater relationship. He just wants to have that covenant relationship. He wants you, under you to understand that He called you to be a son of God. You didn't choose that. He chose that title for you. The one who translated you is the one who determines what position you are with him. And he's determined that we're sons of God under, with authority and the power to be an overcomer in this world. Amen. Amen. God is good. Let's stand.